Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. On today's show, Republicans were even more complicit than we thought in carrying out and covering up Donald Trump's coup. Kevin McCarthy gets caught lying. Stacey Abrams joins to talk about her race for governor. And later, some recommendations on what to watch and read if you're planning to quit Twitter now that it's owned by Elon Musk. But first... <laughs> can, I, can I read you my favorite overreaction tweet? Sure. Oh, we're going to do it now? Yeah, sure. Why not? Well, this guy named Noah Pollack suggested that there be a Truth and Reconciliation Committee to figure out if conservatives were banned from Twitter. So, you know. Everyone's taking this in stride, I think. A format usually reserved for, you know, apartheid or uh, a lot of not people, shadow bans. A lot of people bands. are pretty confused about what Twitter is. I thought it was people publishing sentences while on the toilet. <laughs> But, but a lot of people seem to think they're crossing the Delaware, and <laughs> it's surprising. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump ahead. <laughs> Do you guys want to talk about our new uh, Twitter overlord for a second? I mean, I'm surprised he did it. I really am. I would have bet money that he would get bored. And, he really and went through on. with it. That's a lot of money to buy a problem. It's a know? lot of money, and it's like he's very leveraged. You know, he's getting all these loans against his stock. Uh, he's taking out other loans to fund other businesses. Like, I don't, this is... This is dicey for him. This Forty-four billion dollars. The the best tweet I saw was just someone that said forty-four billion dollars for this yeah, from Quinta Brunson. <laughs> oh, Quinta Brunson. Forty-four billion dollars for this. I mean, it, like <laughs> the, the amount it's going to cost him to service the debt on this deal is going to be massive. Also, like, just go fix climate change, man. We would all love you. Just k- keep focused on the one thing. You're not good at interpersonal stuff. You know, that's what Twitter is. This is about a human to human issue. That's, <laughs> that's not a good point. Thing. That's that is in his not thing. his forte. That is not his forte. Go engineer some no. stuff. Uh, you know, some people, some people are like he's an idiot, winning. whatever. I'm like, no, he's a, he's a he's a genius on 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 certain areas. I don't know about like yeah, interpersonal communication is going to be a strong suit. No, I had a we John and I had a meeting with him once, and uh, oh my goodness. we sat behind him in silence for five minutes while he uh, henpecked at his emails. He literally wouldn't turn his chair around to, to look, look at us. At us the whole time. This is so fucking weird. I think that's cool. And he's like tweeting about Bill Gates being pregnant. What, where did that come from? He's a weird dude. He's a weird dude. I'm sorry. Bill Gates is pregnant? Yeah, <laughs> buried the lead. Yeah, that was his, tweet. That was his tweet yesterday. Um, anyway. That's look, a big uh, deal. Uh, you know, my stance on this is I hope he shuts it down. <laughs> <laughs> I think, look, I, I say this as a Twitter addict. We'll st- we'd still all be better off. We'd all be better off if tomorrow we woke up and there was no Twitter. Get on TikTok. It's much more fun. Right. The fun thing, like, the question is what will this mean for – Gab, Parler, Truth Social, Getter, because a bunch of MAGA chuds put a lot of money into these things, including yeah. Mr. Donald Trump. And there's a, the big question of whether Trump will get back on soon, whether like Alex Jones will be allowed on. Like, How free is your speech, Mr. Musk? The most, the most surprising thing development today was Donald Trump telling Fox News, I'm not getting back on if, if Elon invites me back on because of, uh, yeah. because of uh, Truth Social, mm-hmm. which he hasn't been it. using either. He hasn't used it once. Yeah, I, I, don't, yeah, I don't buy it. Yeah, that's, that's not, that can't be. You know, uh, we don't really like anyone to own Twitter. <laughs> you know, we don't want it to be public. We don't want it to be private. We don't want to be owned by Elon Musk. We didn't like it when it was run by the previous group of uh, uh, libertarians. The fact that Twitter had a board mm-hmm. and was a public company should have – that's that's probably like the most uh, – the, the best you're going to get right there. <laughs> and I do think that there's this – there's this balancing act, right? Like, a, I don't think it's good if there's a big social media platform that that bullies people off because harassment and misinformation are tolerant, uh, tolerated. I think that's a terrible thing. At the same time, I do think we pay a political price when the most extreme and vicious and stupid and venal and uh, unhinged members of the MAGA right are kind of hidden from the public sphere because it sanitizes the Republican Party. And I think we've all paid a price for Trump and his kind of worst qualities being hidden from public view, mostly only manifesting at buffets during weddings at Mar-a-Lago to which he wasn't invited. Like we are, we are not, he is posing just as much of a threat without being as much of a public nuisance as he once was. So I am not, I don't know why anyone thinks that this is good for Republicans. I don't know why these Republicans are applauding themselves. I don't think anybody knows, even if there will be a change, who knows? It's just trolling. I also just think, yeah, I mean, I think what it teaches us is like whether it's a public company with a board, whether it's a private company with an owner like Musk, like you just can't count on the benevolence of corporations to figure out their moderation, their content moderation policies. If we really want to regulate these platforms because we think that they're public utilities, then we are going to have to pass some regulations or laws to do so. You can't just hope that a corporation is going to do it. Elon has not thought deeply on these. Clearly I watched that TED talk he did last week or two weeks ago where he talked about his thoughts on free speech he is like 
the, the hard question, the, the big debates are on the edge cases, buddy, and he has not thought for one second. He's like, oh, the algorithm will fix it. No. No, yeah, no. no. It's, it's not a yeah, it's not an easy fix. Yeah. Yeah. Hard, hard, smart people have failed for a very long time to figure this yeah. out. It's hard. It's really Even hard. the ones who cared and tried. All right, let's get to the news. New revelations about Donald Trump's attempted coup after the 2020 election tell a story of a Republican Party that was both in on the crime and the cover-up. CNN has more Mark Meadows texts, gift that keeps on giving. That guy's fun. I just, uh, <laughs> we're going to get it. But it's so funny to me that he turned over this incredibly incriminating trove of texts and then said, no more cooperation. I'm done. Yeah, just all of my texts yeah. ever. Yeah, the barn door Republican. cannot be closed, sir. He also withheld a thousand messages. Imagine what what's they? in those. Yeah, what I was going to say, because it, in, included in this latest, uh, this latest group that CNN has is uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, saying that she and other MAGA House members want Trump to declare martial law. Mm -hmm. uh, they also had Trump aide Jason Miller suggesting that the president uh, tweet that the insurrectionists are all Antifa. So that's where that came from. You can thank Jason Miller. Um, separately, the January 6th committee filed a brief in court uh, the other day that shows even though Secret Service warned Meadows that there were intel reports about potential violence on the 6th, the White House chief of staff and several MAGA congressmen strategized about sending protesters to the Capitol after Trump's speech. And in their soon to be released book about the aftermath of 2020, New York Times reporters Jonathan Martin and Alex Burns report that soon after January 6th, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell, quote, told associates they believed President Trump was responsible for inciting the deadly riot and vowed to drive him from politics. McCarthy quickly called the report totally false before being almost immediately humiliated by the release of an audio recording that suggests otherwise. Let's listen. Well, the only discussion I would have with him is that I think this will pass, and it would be my recommendation we should be done. I've, I've had it with this guy. Uh, what he did is unacceptable. Um, nobody can defend that, and nobody should defend it. Before we get to McCarthy, um, what do you guys think is uh, particularly notable or significant uh, in those Meadows texts that CNN obtained or the Meadows court filing from the weekend. A lot of Meadows news. A lot of news. Also, for, just, for like, credit to Kevin for being audible with that ball gag in his mouth. That is not easy. <laughs> don't kink shame Kevin McCarthy. No, no, no. He's just don't kink the shame. He's don't, don't kink shame. Obviously, Kevin McCarthy enjoys being dominated both politically and probably also sexually, and there's nothing wrong. I didn't mean sexually. I just meant politically. I know, but I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Mm-hmm. Anyway, does someone have some notable <laughs> some texts? I have some that notable texts. I have so about. many. Go ahead. First of all, uh, not only did people, <laughs> it was it was so clear to even the most right wing members that Trump was responsible for this insurrection. They were desperately texting from inside the Capitol. Even Marjorie Taylor Greene was texting, "Please tell the president to calm people. This isn't the way to solve anything." <laughs> yeah, tell the way to solve it is through martial <laughs> law. Let's have some orderly martial law, not a, none of this nonsense of people running around the Capitol. <laughs> martial law, to, and other, the other thing about, obviously martial law is uh, these people are fascists and authoritarians, but I don't even understand, it's like, step one, martial law. Step two, what? What do you get with martial law? You just, mm. you just shut the whole country down and then all of a sudden he's won the election? Very, just sort of like baffling. Just it's just they're kind of doing authoritarian jazz. She also, she also spelled it uh, M A R S H A L. -L. Of course, she just did. a small thing. Of course, but, she did because yeah. everything is very stupid and very important. <laughs> she also she said uh, some members of the caucus are suggesting martial law. I don't know on these things. I just wanted to tell. You. I just wanted you to tell him. Like what do you? What does that even mean? Yeah, you I don't want to alternate. Want to yeah, alternate? Okay, this is one of my favorites. I just like how they, <laughs> the range of requests for Mark Meadows is so broad. <laughs> Bernie Carrick texts Mark Meadows and asks him for hotel accommodations and a ride from the airport. I just, <laughs> it's the White House chief of staff. <laughs> the chief of staff like one of the most powerful people in the world. I wonder if it was Dulles or DCA. That, that's actually a, a big distinction. Wild. And the uh, he did call him Sir in those requests, though. <laughs> sir, right. you need. We need a ride and we need a hotel. Sir, I do not like that Radisson. Sir. <laughs> so. Obviously, the still, one of the funniest aspects of these texts is Rick Perry denied this ever happened, but Rick Best. Perry uh, signs his text, Rick Perry, with his <laughs> phone number, and they confirmed it's his number. So Rick Perry was texting uh, to incite the coup. Uh, but one, I think, more chilling aspect of this was that it, it was around Jeffrey Clark, this Trump apparatchik inside of the DOJ. And one thing that does come across through all of these text messages is this was a coup uh, that didn't fail for lack of effort. They didn't have enough 
uh, people on their side in a few very key places. And you read these texts yeah. and you realize mm. how close we were. A few other turns, a few abilities to get one or a, a few places where they can get one or two more Trumpists in place of the Department of Justice. Pence goes the other way under an incredible amount of pressure. We could be in a very different country right now. Well, they're all talking about that in all of these texts, too. Many different people suggest, oh, we just got to send it back to the states because they were all very confident that if they got back to the state legislatures, that the state legislatures controlled by Republicans in a lot of these states would just send an alternate slate of electors and then we'd be in chaos. I also liked um, when Sean Hannity was asking for his marching orders for Mark Meadows and yeah. his response was, yes, sir, Hannity replied. So you know, speaking of sirs, yeah, he does get the respect real. from Sean. Um, the other great one. It just tells you everything you know about all the, this crew is you can see Jason Miller making up lies in real time yes. and suggesting that Trump should tweet them. So he's like 345 that day. Jason Miller is saying we should tweet that Antifa infiltrated yeah. the January 6th crowd. Get that out there. He wants uh, Trump to blame Antifa for the, for the insurrection. And again, like the demoralizing thing is Jason Miller, still a source for tons of reporters, quoted all the time, spinning these stories. Uh, and speaking of Jason Miller lying, so... You know, one, one thing we are learning is that on that that a lot of the people involved in this illegal effort to overturn the election were told it was illegal in advance, which is important. They yeah, knew it was illegal. It's be important. It is also important that a lot of them were told that there was a risk of violence. That is very clear. Uh, the other piece of this is Miller uh, is basically trying to I think before he realized just how fast this this bus was going was trying to stop it and he said hey we're looking at the data here we can't find this mm -hmm. fraud that you're if if there was basically because trump overperformed in certain ur urban areas there wasn't some <laughs> there was no way to find evidence of some stuffed ballots because the just the votes weren't there that's not where biden was winning and miller is pointing this out so in real time they're also very much aware that what they're talking about uh, are just bald, bald face lies. Which is very important yes. as we get into the legal ramifications of all this, because again, they're all saying, oh, we're just objecting because we really believed there was voter fraud, but they didn't really believe there no. was voter fraud because they knew there wasn't voter fraud. They lied. Um, and also, the texts are very fun, but th that filing um, that the January 6th committee uh, filed in court um, to get the rest of Meadows' texts, um, you know, there has been plenty of public evidence since January 6th that Trump incited the crowd but the question that hasn't been answered is to what extent did Trump and his senior staff plan, organize, and direct the riot itself, and why didn't they stop it earlier? And now we're starting to see, well, the Secret Service you know, said there were intel reports that there's going to be violence, and, and knowing that those reports were true— Meadows and a bunch of members of Congress were still like, yeah, we should send, we should send this crowd to the Capitol, even if we know there could be violence. Yeah, they didn't care. Just ridiculous. Part of the plan. Um, all right. Let's turn to the man uh, Trump once referred to as Mike Kevin. Mike Kevin. Uh, the guy who once gave him his favorite starbursts. Remember? He put was him it in a pink or red? It was pink and red. Okay. You got him. It was both. Well, that's Trump I mean. likes pink and red the best. So, so, so Kevin McCarthy bought a bag of Starbucks, picked out Starburst. all the Starbursts. Sorry. Uh, picked, uh, picked out all the red and pink Starbursts, put them in a jar, put his name on the jar. Said this is from Kevin McCarthy to Donald Trump and sent him the jar. Pink and red are the best, though. Um, all right. What, what's, what was your reaction to the phone call, uh, to the audio recording, and, uh, and to McCarthy's pretty terrible attempt at lying about it? Tommy? By, well, here's my little uh, progression of feelings about this. <laughs> what an idiot. How did he not know there were tapes? This is a big conference call. Liz Cheney was on it. She hates her guts now. Uh, oh, yeah, wait. McCarthy believes in nothing. Uh, he has no dignity. He has no integrity. He just wants power. And his read on the last half decade of politics is that lying about everything doesn't matter. Watch Trump. He did it. It worked for him. The press corps won't even use the word lie half the time. So what's the downside? Then I thought, oh, how can reporters ever quote McCarthy again after this? Then I thought, oh, wait, they absolutely will. Half of them said he was caught in a falsehood. It wouldn't even call it a lie. Then I wept into my hands. Um, <laughs> and then I just remembered, oh, yeah, uh, Kevin McCarthy can't be speaker if Trump doesn't back him. And that's all he cares about. End of scene. Love it. I think they got it. <laughs> the uh, scenes from a marriage. Yeah, it's um. So it's not. Do we know right now who recorded it? Liz Cheney denies that oh, she's the I person who recorded it. She's, yeah, her, she's, but, she's but denying she's it to the, I'm fake but whatever. Music. Of course she would. Right. What? I mean, who who would say? Yeah, it was me. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Who else? We don't know who else was. I mean, we don't know the full whatever. Uh, it was been, recorded. She's been on an integrity kick lately. So good I'm for you. To, I'm person to who trust recorded her. Yeah. Thank you for whoever recorded it. Yeah. I mean, it struck me that the 
the statements you know, McCarthy's a liar and he doesn't care about having credibility he doesn't care what the you know mainstream press reports but it did strike me that he denied it with the uh, enthusiasm and confidence of someone who wasn't aware that the conversation was recorded yeah that was weird because they, they because it was a problem I mean he's he took it took him three days to figure out what to do and he had to go to the border so that he could be asked about it so that he could change the subject to the border he's like that's that a was two thousand mile flight that was years ago that was years ago this is today and what happened is the reporter asked me if I asked if I called President Trump and said will you resign and I didn't call him I was talking to members about something I'm like no no that's actually that's not true <laughs> but <laughs> now you he lied again at the border because what the <laughs> Because he, he says, what, what here's the, what I think. Because what they actually asked him and his spokesman was, is it true that you told members mm -hmm. that you were thinking of calling and resigning? He said, no, that's not true. Yeah, yeah there, there, just, so there just, was, no, it was a, no nuance in the denial. no nuance in the It was just a lie. Um, by the way, Mitch McConnell sort of going under the radar here uh, because, you know, McCarthy, there was a recording. But McConnell said at one point, the Democrats are going to take care of the son of a bitch for us. If this isn't impeachable, I don't know what is. Mitch McConnell, who, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, then chatted with Jonathan Swan and said, oh, yeah, absolutely. Nominee. Absolutely. I support him. If he's yeah. nominee and just ultimately did, voted against impeachment. I, I and, did. And uh, Mitch can count votes like he knows that that's not the, the weird thing about that quote is he knows that's not possible. The Democrats couldn't have taken care of him for them. The, uh, yeah, maybe he thought it was just like he thought he was going to get it from the House and yeah, then that's know, fine, yeah. which he did. Look, <laughs> Democrats are going to take care of Trump for him. Like, I just let's believe in ourselves. Bet on you. As let's 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 have as much faith in us as McConnell has in us. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, well, so there were some people, including me, who thought that this revelation would might cause Trump and MAGA world to turn on McCarthy and endanger his political future. Like you just said, Tommy, he can't be speaker without Trump's support. Um, but Trump apparently told McCarthy, I'm not mad at you, uh, after McCarthy called him after this whole episode and begged for forgiveness. Uh, love it. What do you make of Trump's reaction? <laughs> Trump's quotes on this. Uh, uh, I think it's all a big compliment, frankly. They realized they were wrong and supported me. He said, I like him. And other than that brief period of time, I suspect he likes me quite a bit. That's what that's what Trump said about about Kevin McCarthy. They're all just like really self-serving quotes like, oh, no, he doesn't care. He thinks it makes him look strong and powerful, said a lying Trump aide on background to some credulous reporter. But then Trump got on the he did a poolside interview with The Wall Street Journal and then repeated all the same lines. The only thing better to Donald Trump than someone who has been crawling on their hands and knees behind him for years is someone who claimed that they were tougher and better and didn't need him and were stronger and were against him and ended up right back on their knees crawling behind too. Yeah. He loves it. I mean, I also, it. I also think, you know, Trump wants to be liked, of course. He, he desperately wants to be liked. But what he wants even more is to be feared. And McCarthy fears him. Mm -hmm. And McConnell fears him and they all fall in line and he wants them all to fall in line and they all have fallen in line. And like, you know, as we I saw Dan tweet this, but he was like, you know, the, the real conclusion from this whole thing is if uh, Republicans take the House and Kevin McCarthy's speaker, he's under Donald Trump's control. He, well, he, he'll I mean, do whatever Donald Trump wants him to do and so Mitch McConnell f for till the end of time. And, and, and the most important thing Kevin McCarthy did is not briefly flirt <laughs> <laughs> with private bravery on the phone with Liz, Liz Cheney. The most important thing he did was lead his caucus to try to overturn the election in the House. Yeah. Because his entire caucus voted. He could not stop it. Uh, he was aligned with it. And so you look at Kevin McCarthy, you put Kevin McCarthy as speaker. That is that is someone who will lead the Republican caucus to overturning an election. That is what they already did. That is what they will do again. So why not keep him there? Yeah, I think Trump sort of owned him before this happened. Now he owns him more. I mean, mostly this is getting suppressed. Like Fox News is not really reporting on the story the the bannon types are really pissed about it and they're out there raising hell like him and boris epstein on the oh they show. are still mad about yeah mad I, at McCarthy. I, I, I dip back into my uh, i was gonna say we have our special habit. correspondent here i've been trying to not do that for a while but uh, i'm gonna go back in um bannon's out there saying now okay now we own kevin now kevin has to be 100 percent maga that means he has to stop <laughs> going against <laughs> maga candidates in primaries that means he has to put like, forward maga policy where has he been anything but 100 percent maga recently yeah but you know, I mean, they're gonna hold him down and cover swastika in his forehead <laughs> I just, you know, but like Sarah Longwell, who writes for The Bulwark, does a lot of focus groups, said she did a focus group of Trump voters in Ohio, asked them if they'd heard anything about Kevin McCarthy lately. It was crickets. No one had heard of it. It's just not getting reported out. So the bigger sin on this call was maybe McCarthy saying he wanted tr Twitter to strip Republicans like <laughs> Boebert and I think MTG of their social media accounts. That is like, yeah, you know, you can't do that.
Yeah, no, this is definitely a story that in no way is going to like break through to most people in the country. It's only interesting if Trump decided that he was pissed off at McCarthy over this or if other Republicans are pissed off at McCarthy mm -hmm. about this for what you just said, Tommy. And then it jeopardizes, um, you know, his path to being speaker someday. And Matt Gates tweaked out. <laughs> put out a statement attacking McCarthy, but that was kind of it. And he, yeah, he kind of jumped the gun fast. on that. He yeah, he jumped fast. it too fast. I don't think he jumped the gun. I did it because he, wa he wanted to get his shots in before, before, Trump, oh, before Trump stopped uh, him. Yeah. But uh, the other, just one other point about this, too, is I, I, I wish there was more of a connection being made between the willingness of people like Rick Perry, Kevin McCarthy, others in these texts to just not issue non-denial denials, not to elide the truth, but to just look reporters in the eyes, look people in the eyes and just lie. Uh, with the content of the messages themselves, there is something. I know, man. Uh, 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 there is there's something they have in common, which is, hey, like these are not obviously these people are not on the level, but it's worse than that, right? Like they're not in a democracy with you, they're not in a civil society with you, they're not engaged in a great debate with you to see who should uh, win elections and take power the old-fashioned way. They are trying to control power in any way that they can, and one, in the same way, Tommy, as you point out, that they kind of. There's almost like an emergent lie of blaming Antifa that pops up through these texts. You see that same emergent lie of coming up with false voter fraud ideas, coming up with uh, oh, yeah. uh, Dominion theories, Soros theories, all these theories that start popping up in these texts purely because they just need something to say and they know it isn't they'll true. Just, they'll cling to anything. So uh, Trump had a similar reaction to past criticism from Ohio Senate candidate J.D. Vance, who he endorsed at a rally this weekend. Uh, let's take a listen. He's a guy that said some bad shit about me. He did. He did. But you know what? Every one of the others did also. In fact, if I went by that standard, I don't think I would have ever endorsed anybody in the country. You want to know? That's, that's a good point. <laughs> I guess, I, since when does Trump not hold a grudge? The, I guess it's just... The guy is just riding high. He's generous. He's sitting on his throne <laughs> dispensing... <laughs> he's sitting there dispensing uh, indulgences. He's magnanimous. Yeah, he's just giving people their 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 their, um, their lordships and their and their earldoms, you know? Yeah. I think this just comes back to... Look, Trump knows that, that the, uh, the other major opponent in this race, Josh Mandel, he might literally be a serial killer. You know, like if he had... Someone just chained in his basement for half a decade. Like, it wouldn't surprise me at all. I think Trump knows that. He likes to gossip about us in the Daily Beast, has been reported. I think he's also one of the dumbest human beings He's alive. just horrendous. And also, Peter Thiel's money and influence is, a, is big and prominent and I think, like, actually means something. Yeah, I think Trump would rather be with a winner who pretends to like him than a loser who actually likes him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't That's think That's what he wants. He doesn't. Yeah. He, he, <laughs> He knows you, no you can like him or not like him. You just got to be a winner in and, his and, eyes. And you can't want it too hard in his presence. He doesn't like that. That's yeah, what Lindsey Graham taught yeah, us, Yeah, that's right? a little gross to him. You can't supplicate too much. Yeah. Uh, all right. Before we move on, uh, we should again point out that the MAGA wing of the Republican Party is also busy making sure that their next coup succeeds. Uh, over the weekend, the Michigan Republican Party uh, nominated Matt DiPerno for Attorney General and Christina Caramo for Secretary of State, uh, two Trump-endorsed candidates who have no real qualifications other than being election fraud activists. Guys, what do we know about these two? So election fraud activists is such a yeah. <laughs> convivial term. <laughs> Look, uh -huh. they're just trying to change the world. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. These are some wild people. Does anyone want to, Tommy, do you, sure, what, I mean, what do you know about these idiots? Kristen Caramo, uh, who would be the Secretary of State if she wins the, her election, um, she would then go on to oversee cybersecurity of elections, audits, general trust and transparency uh, in, in the next contest. She doesn't believe in evolution. She doesn't think it should be taught in schools. She calls public schools government indoctrination camps. She speaks at QAnon gatherings, including the convention in Vegas, which, you know, that's a tough booking. So that's good for her. Also, that's the big one. You don't want to miss that one. You don't want to miss that one. Uh, We're always looking for an excuse to go to Vegas, boys. <laughs> <laughs> she thinks Antifa is behind the insurrection. She's an anti-vaxxer. I mean, basically, like, she... You know, the, the, we laugh at that description you had at the top of who these people are, but she showed up at the uh, a vote counting center in Detroit. She saw someone, you know, she spotted a ballot on the screen where a voter appeared to have cast their ballot along straight party lines for both main parties. And she heard some supervisor tell a poll worker to push the ballot through. She decided that meant give that vote to Biden. What the head of the elections for the state of Michigan under Republicans mm -hmm. and Democrats for years say is that she just completely under misunderstood what she heard. And what they were saying is, okay, like, don't count that vote, but put it in the bill where we don't discard it. Just sort of like 
it, it just sits in sort of a pending area, but it doesn't get fraudulently counted for anybody because this voter obviously voted for two candidates. But this this story she told made her a celebrity, got her a ton of money, and now she is the the, the nominee. I mean, she is nominee for she State, is out there with sixty seven like, percent of the vote. Said LGBT people violate God's creative design. Uh, she called Republicans who don't support her traitors. She called Democrats satanic. Um, she is just. She she said that all the police officers who testified before the January sixth committee are crisis actors. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's uh. So Amanda Carpenter at the Bulwark uh, had the story about these two. Uh, by the way, DeParno. We haven't talked about him, Matt DeParno. He wants to be Attorney General. Um. He filed a bunch of lawsuits uh, saying that he has proof the voting machines were corrupted. They all got thrown out, of course. Uh, he also has promised that if he's elected, he'll prosecute and imprison the current Democratic attorney general. Okay. Uh, so that's his campaign promise. Good. Uh, Amanda Carpenter was saying that the Michigan GOP, they actually had a questionnaire for all of these candidates to, to decide whether they're going to endorse them or not in the, uh, in the general election. And on the questionnaire, there were, um, there were questions like, Define a rhino in your own words. <laughs> what do you believe happened at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th? Were you there? By the way, uh, I just, I just, what I like about these questions, too, is it's like they're like flying off the fucking handle because there's a math textbook that asks a kid how they feel about math. These are the most feelings-based fucking people. An election, who wins an election is based primarily on how it feels to you in the moment. That's the next What do you believe happened on Election Day, November 3rd? Do you believe there was fraud? Do you support a full forensic audit and, invest, audit and investigation? Should Domin D Dominion voting machines be removed? And should election officials be held accountable, prosecuted, and removed for violations? That was the questions asked. And of course... You can imagine how uh, how how DePerno and uh, Caramo answered all of those questions. Ten out of ten, five on the AP. So that is the not those are be, the, so they will officially be endorsed at the party's convention uh, soon. That will be your Republican candidate for attorney general and your Republican candidate for secretary of state, the top elections official in the state of Michigan. Terrifying. That is that's how important that that race is. Yeah, uh, Caramo is the first election denying Secretary of State to get to the general election, but one of like a dozen or more nationwide who's running. So scary trend there. VoteSaveAmerica.com slash midterms, guys. Go and uh, sign up for a region. Who's who's got the Midwest? Especially is that you, these, Tommy? It sure is, guys. <laughs> this is why we gotta we gotta care about top of the ticket and down ballot. That's right. Throw Tommy's Midwestern region some love. All yeah, right, please. Yeah. Sign up. Come on. We just Come on, they got cheese curds up there. We do. They got cheese curds and election denier activists. We got election deniers, we got cheese curds. <laughs> Detroit we got style pizza. All kinds of things in Wisconsin that are fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Culver's. That's selling it. Culver's. That's yeah. selling it right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can go. All right, sign Let's up. Go for a trip. All right, when we come back, love it, and I will talk to Stacey Abrams. I also asked about Star Trek. <laughs> the presenting sponsor of this episode of Pod Save America is Simply Safe Home Security. When Simply Safe Home Security founders, Chad and Eleanor Lauren, designed their first security system in their kitchen. Little did they know we'd be here today talking about this project. They couldn't have imagined it. They could not have imagined it. Wow. But we are. But well, we are. Because making people feel safe is what Simply Safe has been doing ever since that moment 15 years ago. Simply Safe has highly trained security experts ready whenever you need them, whether that's during a fire or burglary or medical emergency or even just when you're setting up the system. There's always someone there who has your back to keep you safe and make sure you feel safe. Love it. Discuss your experience with Simply Safe. How's your safe space, Snowflake? Uh, it's it's safe. I'm I'm protected from intruders, ideas I don't like. <laughs> uh, it's hard to get an idea into your house without with with the Simply Safe there. I set it up myself. It was very easy. I, you take it out of the box. You're set up within minutes. It works incredibly well. I've literally never had a problem. It's like the most reliable thing I've I've ever had in my house. I think it's the one stable thing in your life. It's the only thing keeping. <laughs> it's the only thing I can count on. This crazy world. Claim a free indoor security camera plus save 20% on your Simply Safe security system and get your first month free with interactive monitoring service. Visit simplysafe.com slash cricket to customize your system and start protecting your home and family today. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash cricket. Pod Save America is brought to you by Aura. We're excited to tell you about our new sponsor, Aura. Aura is a digital safety service built for modern threats. It's an all-in-one solution that monitors and protects your identity, finances, devices, and more from digital assholes. Wow, that's in the copy. That's in the copy. That's can, just not that's not just my I potty can see mouth. See your aura, John. Aura is on a mission to create a safer internet and for Aura, that not only means creating the best security tools, it means making it so easy you actually use it. Easily keep your passwords safe and secure like automatically updating vulnerable passwords on selected sites. That sounds good. Keep your connection private on public Wi-Fi with one-click encryption. Also important. 
Quickly know if someone has attempted to use your identity or credit without your permission with alerts to your app, phone, or email up to four times faster than competitors. That's also important. Also, or doesn't just catch threats, they help you resolve them with 24 7 Snuffs seven- them out. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. That's too loud. Yeah, that was a Continue. good that's a good use of snuff. Takes them out. Snuffs them out. With 24-7 US-based support and dedicated resolution agents, Aura's team will work with you to resolve fraud issues, even if it means getting on a three-way call with your bank at midnight. Weird use of three-way. Aura doesn't play games with their plans and pricing. All plans come with all the features you need to stay safe, with no add-ons or extras needed. Just choose whether you want to protect yourself, two adults, or your whole family. Plus, the price you pay when you sign up is the price you pay when you renew. Aura won't raise your prices in year two, hoping you won't notice. Aura keeps their plans affordable, so you stay protected. Now, for a limited time, Aura is offering our listeners a 14-day trial, plus a check of your data to see if you've already been part of a data breach. All for free when you visit Aura.com slash Crooked. Go to Aura.com slash Crooked and sign up for a 14-day free trial, plus see if you've already been part of a data breach. That's A-U-R-A dot com slash Crooked. Certain terms apply. See site for details. Aura, the new standard in digital safety. Pod Save America is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. People don't always realize that physical symptoms like headaches, teeth grinding, and even digestive issues can be indicators of stress. Unless you're me, then you have all of them. And let's not forget about doom scrolling, sleeping too little, sleeping too much, under eating, and overeating. Rise and grind, John. Rise and grind. Wow. That's okay. what we say here at Crooked. Please talk about your experience with stress. Is it a daily thing? How do you feel and why? And what stresses you out? Work, bills, life, family? Do you lose sleep, eat more, eat less? I used to manage stress with with uh, edibles, and I've switched to therapy, and oh, I think it's good. probably better. It's what about you. therapy on edibles? Oh. Haven't tried it yet. Haven't tried it yet. Two yeah. great tastes that taste great together. Something to think about. <laughs> yeah. Something to think about. Stress shows up in all kinds of ways and in a world that's telling you to do more, sleep less, and grind all the time. Here's your reminder to take care of yourself. Do less and try some therapy. Therapy, better than grinding. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy. Give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Podsafe America listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash P-S-A. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash P-S-A. Joining us now, one of our favorite guests. She's the founder of Fair Fight, former Georgia House Minority Leader, State Party Leader, and hopefully the next governor of Georgia, Stacey Abrams. Welcome back to the pod. Thanks for having me. Uh, So I'm sure you had better things to do uh, than watch last night's primary debate between Brian Kemp and David Perdue. Uh, but, But what's your reaction from what you've heard about it? And more broadly, how does your message change depending on uh, which one of those goobers uh, wins the Republican primary? Well, if last night's debate is any indication, my message doesn't need to change at all. I'm the only one actually talking about Georgians and their lives, their needs. They spent, to my count, most of the debate either debating who cost whom whatever power they think they're entitled to. But more <laughs> importantly, they spent their time relitigating instead of pressing the issue of how do we serve Georgians going forward. I believe that this is an opportunity for us to look at the pain and the anxiety that people are feeling, to acknowledge that COVID is not gone. Uh, It may be receding, but it is not gone, that the after effects remain with us, that inflation and crime are real salient issues for many people. And they know this too will pass, but they need to know how, and they need to know who's willing to lead them. And unfortunately, there was not a moment dedicated last night to actually articulating a plan for Georgia. There was casting aspersions, casting blame, and casting about for reasons why I shouldn't be the governor, but (laughs) nothing to say why either of them should either get to keep the job or get to have the job. Follow-up question. As the president of United Earth, do you feel you did (laughs) enough to prepare for the dark matter anomaly Was there an intelligence failure with regard to unknown species 10C? And do you view the evacuation of planet Earth as a setback for your administration? I do not believe it was a setback. I do believe that we used the information and the intelligence once we had it. I'm proud of the leadership shown by our military (laughs) and by the support that we received from the reconvening federation. And I look forward to working together and rejoining the federation so that we can anticipate new struggles for all life. Thank Amazing. You. That you. was like you guys just speaking in a foreign language to me. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> um, 
back to this race on this on this planet. Um, there it takes place on Earth, John. It takes place uh, just the 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 ship did jump uh, uh, nine hundred years yes. into the future, but it takes place on Earth. Of course, of course. President of United Earth, <laughs> reconstituting the Federation. Continue. So um, there are a lot of big issues at stake uh, in the midterms. Uh, everything from voting rights to LGBT rights to book bans, abortion. Um, you have chosen to focus your campaign primarily on Medicaid expansion. Can you talk about the decision behind that? I've centered Medicaid expansion as an avatar and as an example of what we can do. The issues that you named are all issues that have to do with quality of life, the kind of lives we have, the access to opportunity that communities and families want, and Medicaid expansion is the beginning. It creates an opportunity for 500,000 Georgians to have access to health care. And that means when you get sick, when you feel a little under the weather, instead of powering through, you can call and make an appointment. If you have you know, access to metformin, that means you don't need access to insulin because you've, you're able to take care of yourself. So there's the health insurance piece. There's also the jobs piece. Medicaid expansion in Georgia will create 64,000 new jobs. Those are good paying jobs across the entire state, especially in rural communities. It saves hospitals. That means people's lives are saved, but also jobs are saved. And writ large for everyone who has insurance, who's thinking, well, what's in it for me? Our costs go down when more people have access. Poor people get sick whether they can afford it or not. I know this for a fact. And the reality is that if we expand Medicaid, everyone's costs go down. And at a time when people are very price sensitive, when we're paying attention to every penny, Medicaid expansion is a $3.5 billion infusion of Georgia taxpayer dollars into our state coffers to help our fellow citizens and take care of our communities. And so I start there because it's about health care. It's about education because that means we improve our property tax value so we can put more into education. It's how we improve our economy. It is the single most effective jobs program, health program, and infrastructure program I can imagine for Georgia. So the Republicans in your state are, are obviously focused on a lot of other things. Uh, the Georgia legislature is trying to pass their own version of Florida's Don't Say Gay bill. Uh, they're trying to pass a bill that limits how race can be discussed in the classroom. They're trying to pass book bans. Um, so there's some strategists that say, you know, Democratic candidates should avoid taking the bait on these culture war fights. Others say that's wrong. The Democrats should try to fight and win these culture wars. What has your strategy been and, and what are you hearing from voters as you're traveling across the state? Our first responsibility is not to be so reductive. We're talking about how our children learn, how they live. When you have a conversation or when there is legislation that will legitimize banning children from sports, what we're telling our most vulnerable children in their most fragile moment is that you don't belong. That's not a culture war. That is a parenting issue. That is a people issue. That's a humanity issue. And yes, we should talk about how we want every child to feel they belong in our community. When we talk about banning books, when there is legislation to lie about our history, then we are t teaching our children either to tell the truth or to tell lies, to either be resilient or to manufacture the, the truth that they want. This is about how we grow strong, resilient adults who become good citizens. When we have debates about whether we talk about homosexuality and sexual orientation and sexual identity, it's about how do we have conversations about who we are. This isn't about a war. This is about who we are as people. And when we avoid conversations about humanity, we allow inhumanity in. And so my responsibility is not to take the bait by using whatever pejorative term they choose to use, but to integrate these conversations into how I talk about education, how I talk about the economy, how I talk about leadership. We should want leaders who want thoughtful, resilient adults who know that we've made mistakes but know that we can be better when we acknowledge those mistakes and understand the history behind the mistakes and the history behind how we redeemed ourselves. So, so if you're the governor of Georgia and it's time to appoint the leaders of your administration, you can only choose Star Trek characters. Of course. <laughs> Which Star Trek characters are you putting in key positions? Uh, I would begin by looking to my science officers because we are still in the midst of a crisis in our public health infrastructure. I think that Dr. Beverly Crusher is an important person to look to. Very I smart. think the doctor would make sense as an adjunct. I would certainly look to bringing together a cabinet of leaders who've demonstrated that they can navigate difficult situations. So Catherine Janeway, I think Picard's a little busy 
uh, in a different timeline right now. Uh, <laughs> but I would, of course, want to turn to Michael Burnham and invite her to this conversation. And I think that, you know, Captain Cisco is someone who has a thoughtful understanding of how to navigate difficult times, especially times given that, you know, Ron DeSantis has said something about not liking me. I might need his <laughs> ambassador behavior to help navigate how we work better with all the states that are surrounding us. Wow. I, I wonder, you know, I think Dr. McCoy would be anti-mask on plane, but I think Beverly Crusher might be for it. What do you think? I think both of them would want to take care of the people around them okay. and would mask up for everyone's safety. Okay. 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 I just want to point out this has been seamless between <laughs> this answers. Is, this is going exactly as we planned. I know. Exactly as we planned. I, I have one more Star Trek question. Do you have okay. any more other I, questions? I have one. Yeah, I have okay. one more. Um, I, I'm not going to call it a real question. A different question. Thank you. Different Thank category you of question. Thank you to both. We, we appreciate that. Um, <laughs> So uh, you've done a lot of uh, fighting for voting rights to protect voting rights. Uh, obviously, uh, there's a you know a lot of new voter suppression laws, including in your state. Can you talk about what your campaign and other Georgia organizers are doing to overcome or get around the new voter suppression law, and also sort of how that's landing with voters? Because I think as you you and I have talked about so many times, you know one of the more pernicious effects of, of voter suppression is that it makes people feel why should I even bother trying? Why should I even why should I even try to go out and vote? Is am I gonna is it gonna be too hard or am I gonna get turned away or is my vote gonna even count? Well one of the reasons our campaign is being so aggressive about fundraising during a primary, even though I don't have a technical opponent, although last night's debate would signal that I'm already in the midst of a general election that hasn't started, is that part of our responsibility is to map voter suppression for twenty twenty two. We have never seen these new laws in operation on a statewide level. And so our campaign is raising the resources we need to be everywhere, to understand what does voter suppression look like in a suburban under-resourced community that is largely of color versus a rural community that is isolated and has been fighting over whether they have one or two precincts. We want to be everywhere and understand it. And we are so proud of the organizations that are on the ground that are doing the hard work of educating voters. I'm very proud of how we are anticipating the effects of voter suppression. But we also have to map it out so we know how to circumvent the challenges for the November election. And that is why this is gonna be one of the most expensive elections in Georgia history. This is not simply about electing me or Reverend Raphael Warnock, one of our extraordinary senators. It's about electing two people who understand at the most visceral level what voter suppression looks like, but who have both demonstrated a very strong commitment to defeating it. Because to your point, we know that voter suppression requires education as an antidote, but the most effective response is voter turnout. It is, a, it is a lie to say that increased turnout means there is no suppression. That is again like saying that because more people are in the water, there are no sharks. The sharks are still there, but if more of us get into the water, if we know where they are, if we can get to the buoys, if we can navigate them, I'm going into a whole Jaws metaphor I didn't intend to, to lift up. <laughs> mm -hmm. When we do that, we get more people to the other side. And the more people who can get involved and the more we want them to be engaged and enraged, not defeated. This is our state. We have the right to be heard regardless of party, regardless of who we vote for. And my mission is to ensure everyone has the right to vote. And my responsibility as a candidate is to make certain that when they go and vote, they vote for me. I have a, I have a response. Are you ready? It's going to be pretty painful. Okay. We're, we're going to need a bigger democracy. You know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, I, I did that to I did that to all of us, and <laughs> yeah. you did that I to us. Yeah, I, you, you yes, yeah, there. you set it up. I knocked him down. Uh, Star Trek. It is my view that Star Trek VI: The Undiscovered Country is the greatest Star Trek film ever made. I want to know what you consider to be the best Star Trek film, and I want to ask if you are at least open to considering the possibility that it is Star Trek VI, <laughs> even if it isn't currently your view. I am always open to new ideas and new information. <laughs> Okay. And I have enough respect for you to give you the benefit of every <laughs> doubt that is flooding my mind in this moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so what is your favorite Star Trek film? Actually, I don't have one. I, <sighs> I, I like, I really love all of the treks, and it depends on what I'm in the mood for. You like the one where they find God? Do you like that one? I, where God's just a kind of, a kind of, a kind of guy in the, he's got, got a hologram I, going? So you, you have to understand, I also watch Supernatural. Mm -hmm. So I, I am more malleable in my willingness to accept different constructs than many are. Okay, okay, okay. All right. See how I danced around that? Danced That's pretty around. good. I, was I felt Thank political. <laughs> I felt political. 
Um, Stacey Abrams, thank you so much for joining as always. Uh, I know the uh, the fundraising deadline for your for your, uh, for this this quarter is coming up, so uh, everyone out there, uh, Stacey needs all the help that she can get to uh, to go against one of these two bozos. So uh, yeah. get get moving right here on Earth. Absolutely, StaceyAbrams.com, a terrestrial address that you can go to right now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Pod Save America is brought to you by Chili Sleep. Science tells us that the best way to achieve and maintain consistent deep sleep is by lowering core body temperature. Temperature-controlled sleep repairs muscle after a hard day's work and improves cognitive function, so you always start your day feeling sharp and alert. Chili Sleep makes the coldest and most comfortable sleep systems available. They create the environment that meets the body's natural need for lower core temperatures, promoting deeper, restorative sleep. Chili Sleep makes the Uller Cube and Dock Pro sleep systems, water-based, temperature-controlled mattress toppers that fit over your existing mattress to provide your ideal sleep temperature. These mattress pads keep your bed at the perfect temperature for deep, cold sleep. These sleep systems are designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and give you the confidence and energy to power through your day. You guys ever have a waterbed growing up? It's a, it's a fun concept. I think the execution, less so. Yeah, I, 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 so one of my friend's parents had one, and I remember yep. jumping on yep. a, war, a water thinking bed thinking, I, I wanted one, when, and when, you don't really want one. Yeah. When people had water beds when you were a kid, the whole thing about the water bed was be careful around the water bed. <laughs> <laughs> that was the only thing about water beds. They are, the water they are, bed. they are, they are on a, they are on a night, they are barely holding that Ticking water time bomb. <laughs> so here's the thing with the Uller: it's not like a water it's not bed. Not a water bed. But the ben- the thing that's nice about a water bed is you sort of get this feeling, you know, underneath that there's some there's, that there's some water because there is. What the Uller does is you're sleeping, you turn it on, and suddenly it just starts feeling cool. And you feel like mm-hmm. even if it's hot out, even if there's no air conditioning in your room or the air conditioning in your room isn't to your liking, suddenly it just it cools you down, which actually does help you sleep better. It's mm. no joke. That's so nice. They also just launched the new Dock Pro sleep system. It has two times more cold power than the other models. It's whisper quiet and has a tubeless mattress pad design that allows for five times more cooling contact. Pair it with the new Sleep.me app for enhanced device control and sleep scheduling. Head over to chilisleep.com slash cricket to learn more and save 30% off the purchase of any new Cube or Uller sleep system, plus save 10% off the purchase of a Doc Pro. This offer is available exclusively for Pod Save America listeners and only for a limited time. That's chili, C-H-I-L-I, sleep.com slash cricket to take advantage of our exclusive discounts and wake up refreshed every day. Pod Save America is brought to you by Karayuma, the sneaker brand reimagining classics with you and the planet in mind. It's April, which means it's Earth Month. You're shedding layers and getting ready for more time outdoors, and you have to ask yourself, what's on my feet? I mean, I don't know if you need to ask yourself that question. I don't wear shoes at the office. Comfort comes for much like Adam Newman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's going to be a runner in this. We we crashed as a whole thing with us. We're crashing here. Comfort comes first, whether you're running to catch your train or getting your steps in. But that doesn't mean looks can't be a close second. Lightweight yet durable, Carium is Aka sneaker is made ethically and sustainably from materials like organic cotton, recycled plastic, and natural rubber. But the biggest difference between these sneakers and your old canvas sneakers, Aka is actually comfortable. It's like a cloud. It's like a cloud. Cloud-based like a cloud. tech solution. Carium designed their cork plus memory foam insoles to mold to your foot to ensure a perfect fit. Your standard memory foam is a kind of plastic made from petroleum. Ugh. But theirs is made from organic mamona oil. Made from Jason Mamoma. Jason Mamoma. 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 Jason Mamoma. 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 Whatever Jason his name Mamoma is. oil. His oils must be valuable. <laughs> Which is plant based, never plastic. Okay, Tom. Well, we love Karyuma because they really do have a style and color for everyone, from bright pink and tangerine orange to classic neutrals, pastels, and prints. They're also famously collaborative. <laughs> Famous. You want to be known as famously collaborative. Yeah, look it up, yeah. Um, we, we heard they just dropped a spring collection with Pantone. They also have a limited edition sneaker with Atari, for all of you old enough to remember what Atari is. Carrium takes care of the planet and their carbon footprint, and they're leveling up this commitment to celebrate Earth Month. From April 22nd to the 30th, your sneakers plant not one, not two, but ten trees a lot of trees which helps to restore biodiversity to the brazilian rainforest as always carima ships all their sneakers free and fast in the usa and offers worldwide shipping and 60-day free returns and for a limited time pod save america listeners can get an exclusive 15 percent off your pair of carima sneakers go to cariuma.com slash cricket to get 15 percent off that's cariuma.com slash cricket for 15 percent off only for a limited time pod save america is brought to you by stamps.com If you've got a small business, inflation isn't doing you any favors right now. It's harder than ever to stay profitable. Wow, inflation has worked its way into the Stamps.com ads. Guess we should blame the media. (laughs) Yeah, sure. (laughs) 
If you're looking for a way to cut costs, mailing and shipping is a great place to start. Simply use Stamps.com to mail and ship and get access to exclusive discounts and great rates on shipping from USPS and UPS. It's an easy way to keep more money in your pocket. That's why we've used Stamps.com since our early days at here at Crooked Media. Back when stamps cost is five cents. Yeah, back before the Biden inflation days. Hmm. And uh, in the Trump administration, stamps were much cheaper. I'm when, just, Joe I'm Biden mean, first, not true. when Joe Biden first started mailing things, he handed it to a man on a horse. <laughs> <laughs> Stamps.com saves you time, money, and stress. Get discounts you can't find anywhere else, like up to 30% off USPS rates and 86% off UPS. No matter what business you're in, Stamps.com can help you save on shipping. Whether you're an office sending invoices, an Etsy shop sending your products, or a warehouse shipping out truckloads of orders, Stamps.com is the mailing and shipping solution for you. Sell from multiple stores, no problem. Stamps.com seamlessly works with Shopify, Amazon, Etsy, eBay, and more. All you need is your regular computer and printer. No special supplies or equipment. You'll be up and running in minutes, printing official postage for any letter, any package, anywhere you want to send. Start mailing and shipping with Stamps.com and keep more money in your pocket every day. Sign up with promo code CROOKED for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code CROOKED. Oh, we got a lot of mailbag questions about what we're watching and reading. Uh, and since I know everyone's about to quit Twitter because uh, Elon Musk just bought it, we boogity, thought we we thought we'd talk. We thought we'd offer some non-Twitter content recommendations for you all. All right, what are you guys watching and reading? Huh? I saw everything, everywhere, all at once over the weekend, and it is fantastic. I want to see that movie so badly. Go see, see it. That. <clears throat> it is delightful and weird, and goes in places you don't expect at all, but also very sweet and. Nice family story. Oh, that's awesome. You know, we had Adam Scott on Love It or Leave It uh, before Severance came out, and he's like, I'm in this thing called Severance. And I said, what is it? He goes, it's kind of hard to describe. And it is hard to describe. But everybody needs to watch Severance. Why? It's so fucking good. Has anybody in this room seen Severance? No. Anybody? Phoebe? No. Thanks, Elijah. <laughs> it's, it's excellent. It's excellent. And the finale is like a perfect episode of television. We just finished We Crash last love night. We Crash. I love We Crash too. It was very fun. It's funny because I started We Crashed, and I remember after the first episode, I was like, I don't know. The dropout was really good. I don't think it's going to beat the dropout. But We Crash was a show that like every episode got increasingly better and better and better. And by the end, I was I loved it. I think what Re We Crashed did was capture a certain tone and type of Silicon Valley yeah. bullshit that existed during that little time yeah so, i like, love the cult of the founder everything they said was genius we grow we bike like everything that was pitched was they, they just were given these giant checks by softbank or whoever and allowed to do anything i Anne love Hathaway it. was made to play that character i also. love watching Anne hathaway i love i love jared leto with that nose with that schnoz i love the whole thing it is so entertaining shout out lee and drew you know what else was fun that oh I watched? yeah that's right lee uh there's a documentary on Abercrombie and Fitch on Netflix right now. Oh, is that good? It's really good. Uh, Allison Clayman did it. She did a bunch of great docs. And it's a great snapshot in time of like weird culture that like we kind of were all, you know, high school era, maybe a little younger, a little older when Abercrombie came up. Also, um, it's just an insight into how toxic that company was. I had no idea. Abercrombie and Fitch, I wonder. I had no idea. I wonder like if like. If like, I, if my body image issues were a pizza, I wonder how many slices are Abercrombie and Fitch. You know what I, I mean? I the same sort of feeling. Just like, it is. like I, I like I, I think that place just fucked me up. I think you that place they, fucked me up I, when I was a kid. Walking through the mall, just as Jesus, <laughs> just these insanely hot guys. It was like, am I even welcome here? Love it. I I agree. Like watching it sort of brought me back in time to like you know being a, a middle school kid. I mean, like, who the fuck looks like that? Like some of the stores had literal naked humans standing out inside them. Human, like, yeah. It ruled. <laughs> Woods Cologne. Yeah, um, Cologne. I gotta watch that. The music. There's this, um, there's this reality show on Hulu now, uh, Keeping Up with the Kardashians. <laughs> oh, boy. Really? Is that where you are? Yeah. Are you watching I'm it? I've always been watching I'm, it. And I, I've been I know, watching we, it. We know why. We and know I'm where not, it came from. And you know what? I'm, yeah, I'm in. I'm going to watch good? the whole season. I can't. It, well, you realize, because like, I never watched, I probably watched five episodes total in my life of, of Kardashians just because they were like happen to be on, right? And you watch it now after like all of the other reality TV and you're like, oh yeah, these are the people that basically invented reality TV. I get it. <laughs> oh, this is it. This is the, this is the, um, you know, the, the source code. This is the this source is the code. Rosetta this is Stone. where it all came all, from right this here. Is what it's, this is at the heart of the pyramid. <laughs> Wouldn't it be like the real, real world? 
Well, the sort of like the modern era. Some say Jeopardy. Some, some say Jeopardy. <laughs> Any books? Anyone reading anything? Uh, by yeah, okay. The way, you're getting fact check hard <laughs> in the Slack now, John. It's not. No oh, it's longer, just, we're no longer keeping it's up. Just it's called just the Kardashians. Kardashians. Yeah, I thought about that. Unbelievable. Troubling. Uh, I read A Prayer for Owen Meany my senior year of high school. <laughs> I don't really remember it, but Same. I read that then. Same. I just read The News Are by Stephen Lee Myers. It's about Putin. It's pretty good. Oh, I just I I am halfway through because I just interviewed um, uh, the journalist Peter Pomerantsev for Offline, who wrote a book called Nothing Is True and Everything Is Possible about Russia. Like when he he was there for ten years in Moscow as a rea- reality TV producer. Speaking of reality mm-hmm. TV, and it's sort of about Putin's Russia right before 2014, right before the invasion uh, of Crimea. It's an excellent book. You would like it, Tommy? Yeah, I'll check it out. I'm catching up on the season of uh, Drag Race right now, and the but it just fit, the finale just happened and. Uh, uh, my friend Tyler spoiled it. Just he just tweeted the he just tweeted the winner of the season oh, that, that. as it happened. Yeah, Tyler, come on. Come on, Tyler. Ronan's gonna be a judge. Oh yeah, Ronan's gonna be a judge I on saw the that new All Stars. I was yes. like, what is going that, on? That is that was a secret for so long. Yeah, Ronan judge. So there's an the the next season of All Stars are all winners. You've got just an incredible lineup of queens and Ronan judged. And it was because Ronan was going to judge. We're like, oh, we got to catch up. And that's when we got like super, super into Drag Race because uh, like he was going to be on Drag Race. And he, we actually didn't even watch. We just like we started like crushing old seasons. You binged recently, right? I remember yes. you saying this. We started we, and uh, just so that he understood more about it. And then we just became just full addicts. That's cool. Speaking of addicts, I'm reading um, Naked Lunch by William S. Burroughs. <laughs> sort of like a. <laughs> that's a classic. It's a classic. When, when is that from? It's like 59. Yeah. It's real. Uh, it's about like a heroin addict running around like Tangiers. Do we think this segment is working? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Are we still doing the pod? I think, I think Wow, so. I was just sort of looking off into the, I thought that was, I, Anyway, uh, thank you to Stacey Abrams. Thank you to Stacey Abrams. Thank you to Abrams. Stacey Abrams thank for to joining Stacey us Abrams. today. Thank you to Mark Meadows for all the texts. Uh, thank you to Elon. Thank you to uh, Elon for, for all the takes. Tweets. Right, sending everyone into the a tizzy today. May the algorithm look f- fine. May the algorithm look fondly upon Crooked Media. Thanks to our staff for reminding me that it's the Kardashians and not keeping up with the Kardashians. Well, As you can tell, I'm a real connoisseur of this kind of stuff. To keep up here, John. Yep. <laughs> you. <laughs> Check out Hot Take, the newest crooked podcast that provides an honest look at the climate crisis and all the ways media and society are talking and not talking about it. On the latest episode, hosts Mary Anais Hegler and Amy Westervelt break down the origins of Earth Day and name the biggest enemies in the fossil fuel industry. Also this week on America Dissected, Dr. Abdul El Sayed talks to Ai-jen Poo, co-founder and executive director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, about society's treatment of care workers and how their work continues to be undervalued. New episodes of Hot Take drop every Friday in America Dissected every Tuesday. Hot Take crew, <clears throat> they don't like BP. They're not fans of BP. Not fans of BP. Who or, is? Uh, or frankly, a greenwashing on Earth Day. Great yeah. episode. Great Check episode. Great Check it out. You guys have asked for so long. Is there going to be a climate podcast on yeah. Crooked Media? There is. There is now a climate podcast. There is. As part of the Crooked Media check family. Check it out. Go check it out. Go check it out.